I had never quit in anything in my life, and I was ready to quit because the medicine and where I was and how scared I was. But my wife talked me off the ledge, and I said, okay, I'm just going to go day to day. I'm just going to put my hockey helmet back on, and I'm just going to get through the rest of the day. And when I get up tomorrow, I'm going to get up and do the same thing again. Hey everyone, welcome on into Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. And as you can see, we are still in quarantine, Club Cumis, Club 2.0, right here in Toronto, Ontario. Because as I mentioned last week, when you cross the border into Canada, you have mandatory quarantine for 14 days. I'm on day eight of 14. And to be honest, like it's not really that difficult, which I, leads me to believe I'd probably be pretty good in prison, I guess. But honestly, it is just, we have to do this to stay home, to stay safe during this pandemic, because we want to have normal things come back and we want everyone to be safe and healthy and so as you notice this is not how the Air Airbnb came. I decided to decorate it in this way. I've added more lights because someone slid into my DMs and said I needed more lights. And so I wanted to make sure that this set was the best because we welcome in the best here today. I'm very excited for today's guest, none other than award-winning analyst on NHL and NBC. He spent 16 seasons in the NHL, won a Stanley Cup with the New York Rangers, is a US Hockey Hall of Famer, none other than Eddie Olchek. Eddie, thank you so much for joining us here today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Julie. Thank you very much for uh, for having me, and I hope you're uh, you're safe. And I know you're quarantining up there in uh, in Toronto, one of the places I uh, I uh, laid my hat for uh, three plus years in the National Hockey League. So it's uh, great to be with you, and uh, happy holidays to you and your family. Yeah, there's just something special about talking to a former Toronto Maple Leaf, just <laughs> as like a big Leafs fan and someone that uh, you know every single year is hoping hoping for glory and seemingly is always left disappointed, <laughs> even though there's a lot of pieces left. They should be better than they are right now, but we'll, we'll get into that later on. We are on the show. We like to we like to sip on a drink. And what do we have here today? I'm a non-drinker. Uh, people uh, may not believe me. I've never had an issue. I just chose not to drink as a kid. I've only drank three times in my life on purpose. Now, I've had people spike my drinks, which I don't think is very cool, but yeah. that has happened in the past to me, but I chose not to drink, but I got good old water here, so uh, I propose good. it to you, Julie, and happy holidays to you and yours, and uh, stay safe, everybody out there, right? Yes, yes, we are always, uh, we want everyone to stay safe. I've got coffee here. No one spiked it. Not that I know of here in quarantine. You never know, never can be too safe. Um, but we, we so appreciate you being here because today, as people know, we do tape the show ahead of time. This is airing on Friday night. But today, some great news for hockey fans, broadcasters, everyone who loves the good old hockey game is that it looks as though we're going to have a season beginning in the middle of January 2021. Yeah. And, you know, there's sort of, uh, it seemed a little bit of a precarious situation. Just, of course, we're still dealing with the pandemic. What's sort of your initial reaction to the news that we are going to get going soon enough? Well, well, it's very exciting, Julie. I, I mean, I, I kind of always felt that, you know, the January 1 target date that was out there was a little ambitious. But again, I mean, you know, I, I think you have to put some dates out there, I think, for your fan base and, and your in your sponsors as far as a league and for the in particular teams in the National Hockey League. So, um, you know, it seems like there is some momentum. There seems like there's been a lot of conversation here recently between the NHL and the NHL Players Association, and that certainly is a positive. And, you know, look, at it seems like we're getting closer to being on the right side of this worldwide pandemic we're all going through. Uh, you know, maybe the later that you wait, the longer you wait to start your season, maybe you'll have more opportunity to get people into the building mm -hmm. if, you know, over the course of the regular season and then eventually into the playoffs. But at some point here, Julie, as you know, being a big hockey fan, the NHL has to get back on some sort of a schedule, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so you get this season in, you end it in, you know, middle of July at the latest. Then finally, you know, you can get to training camp in September and start your season in October of uh, 21 for the 21-22 season. And as well, let's not forget, you got a new franchise coming into the National Hockey League with the Seattle Kraken. They're going to be coming in next season. So, there, I mean, there are a lot of things. And look, we've all had to stick handle our way through this, uh, through this pandemic. But I, I think I'll get even more excited is once we see a schedule 
And then once right. the schedule is out, then we'll know, okay, well, there's a pretty good chance I'm going to be, selfishly, I'm going to be here, here, and here over the course of the next little while. But again, we've seen what baseball went through, what football has gone through, and now the NBA, if I'm not mistaken, is going to be starting here in the next couple of weeks. So it'll be really interesting. But the one last thing I will say is that having taken part in the bubble with the NHL, Julie, the National Hockey League, did an amazing job. I was in the bubble mm -hmm. for 33 days and the leadership wow. of the commissioner, Mr. Bettman, Bill Daly, the deputy commissioner, the board of governors, all the teams, uh, the NHL Players Association, the return to play committee and hockey operations for the NHL to be able to bring that together and to really have it go off without any hitches. Uh, was pretty amazing. So pretty proud to be a part of it and to be up there and to get a Stanley Cup champion awarded in Tampa. And I'm just looking forward to getting back to some sort of normalcy, whatever that is and whenever that is uh, moving forward here, hopefully in the next, uh, you know, four or five, six weeks. Well, there's excitement that we sort of have the idea that we're going to see hockey in the future, but there are still many more things that we have to check off before we get there to make sure that everyone is safe and healthy as we try to have sports during a pandemic. We've got a whole lot more that we want to get to with Eddie Olchek when we come back on Drinks with Banks. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks, and we're joined here by U.S. Hockey Hall of Famer Eddie Olchek. And Ed, during this offseason, lots of different changes for you, including your broadcast partner, Mike Doc Emmerich, has retired from calling play by play, one of the best to ever do it in really any country in the entire world. How much did you convince him not to retire? I had an idea. It was around the corner, uh, Julie, but uh, I didn't think it was, you know, within 20 feet when the season ended. Uh, you know, Doc and I worked together and probably been his partner for 14 years on the NHL and NBC. And uh, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say I didn't shed a tear and wasn't emotional when Doc called me that day and, and told me that he had made a decision. And uh, and that's all that matters for him. And he's going out uh, on his terms. And uh, I had an incredible run with him and uh, he is a terrific guy that you as you know Julie and uh, we're going to miss him but he's still going to be around he's going to be doing some stuff for us on NBC and uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm look really looking forward to seeing him back in the booth and visiting and I'm sure we'll throw a headset on and you know maybe call a couple of shifts here or there or tell a story and uh, have a few laughs but uh, he you're right he, he is as good as we've ever had in any sport uh, especially here in the US or in North America and mm -hmm. uh, but just very happy for him and Joyce his wife and uh, we're gonna miss him but uh, he did a hell of a job and his uh, resume speaks for itself right and he mentioned to me when I spoke with him that he didn't want anyone to know when he knew that that was his last Stanley Cup final but he didn't want that to sort of change maybe the cadence of how he called it mm -hmm. and for you guys though as you mentioned you were at the games and he was at his home mm -hmm. uh, an analyst and a play-by-play -play, uh, commentator it sort of had this interesting relationship where it's an exchange of energies it feels like when you watch them how are you able to do that when you're in completely different cities yeah I mean it was a challenge uh, but our, our NBC technical crew did an amazing job and there was a very subtle delay if anybody could really tell and you know again as you know Julie when you work with someone or some team for a long period of time you know the cadence you understand the the back and forth you know when somebody's going to take a pause you know when somebody allows you to get in and get out and again as an analyst you know you're waiting for your spot you're picking your spot to when to get in just to give your play-by-play -play partner an opportunity to breathe and I think for all the years working with Doc as I think that you know we've kitted you know, together that, you know, look at, we could, you know, probably be in different rooms and be able to call the game and we would, you know, never step on one another and look at, I mean, it happens in, in whether you're two feet next to him or we're 2000 miles away from him. I think that experience certainly helped us carry us through. Brian Boucher did an incredible job down inside the glass in Edmonton. So to have a three person crew, and bring it to the people, the hockey fans out there uh, was uh, was a real privilege and an honor and very humbling to be able to do it. And again, we're going to miss them. We're going to miss mm -hmm. them a lot. And the game's going to miss them a lot. And uh, somebody's going to get a great opportunity to try to uh, follow in the footsteps mm -hmm. of Doc Emmerich. I get asked that question a lot, Julie. I, I don't know who it's going to be, but uh, uh, we got a lot of great options out there. No, I wasn't even going to ask you that because <laughs> I, I, I've done this job enough times. I understand it's above you. Yeah, I have no... Uh, 
I have no say. I'm just going to I'm yeah. going to show up and whoever's sitting next to me, I'm just going to do my job. And, uh, That's who you'll be calling the game with. Well, you also had a, a busy off season as well, being in contention for a general managing job in Florida. And this, you know, comes on the heels of being interviewed for our, the devil's job. What is it about hockey operations that interests you about getting back into that? Well, I mean, I'm very honored that uh, a couple of teams in the league had called and I had met with them and had some great dialogue and, uh, you know, nothing's come to fruition just yet but i think it's that excitement julie i think it's that you know wanting to be a part of a, a team again so to speak i'm very much at peace at where i am uh, in my life uh, there's a lot of things that have happened here recently uh, that kind of puts everything in perspective i become a grandfather for the first time uh, back on july the 7th Great. congratulations you know and three years ago um three plus years ago i was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer and, and had the battle of my life so I'm on the right side of the grass. I've, I'm very much at peace. I love what I do. I do games nationally for, on NBC, as we talked about. You know, would never say never, but uh, right now I enjoy what I'm doing. And uh, I really would enjoy getting back to work and putting a headset on and talking about what I think is the greatest game in the world. Right. And after having myself spoken and worked with Chris Chelios, he sort of echoed a similar idea that when you're broadcasting a game, you don't really care who wins or loses, you just care for a good game. But when you're part of a team, you get to feel those highs and lows of winning and losing, which is what makes the game so interesting and why we love competition. So we'll have to watch if your career, you know, where it goes, because it's very exciting so far. And there's a whole lot more I want to get to with you on Drinks with Thanks, guys. Don't go anywhere. We've got Eddie Olchek here, and we'll be back after this. Welcome on back to Drinks with Binks. I'm JSB, and we are joined by Eddie Olchek. You know him from NHL on NBC, as well as his 16 seasons in the NHL, U.S. Hockey Hall of Famer, and beyond. And, Eddie, you were mentioning before about the three years ago when you had the scare with stage three colon cancer. And I remember watching the interview at the time that you did with Catherine Tappan on NBC, and I watched it again just a few days ago. And, um, you know, it's incredibly emotional, and it's very open and honest. And of course, you wrote a book, Beating the Odds at Hockey and at Life. And for you now, first of all, how are you doing these days? And secondly, what is sort of your perspective on life having gone through everything that you did? Yeah. Well, there's a lot there, Julie. Um, yeah, I'm feeling good. I'm, I'm, I'm cancer free two plus years now. Uh, Dr. Mary Mulcahy at uh, Northwestern Hospital here in Chicago, I think is the greatest and, and helped talk me off the ledge when I was scared and was in the biggest battle of my life and uh you know it was one day in in uh, the late july of 2017 when i got up and i couldn't go to the bathroom i was constipated and i couldn't go to the bathroom for two days and that wasn't normal for me i knew there was something wrong but i didn't say anything to my wife i didn't say anything to my do a doctor or anything i just kind of let it fester and next thing you know julie i'm having a six hour surgery removing a tumor that I had a blockage in my colon and the thing was the size of my fist they told me and you know they said that we need to take it out and we're gonna send it out and we're gonna see what the hell it is and sure enough on August the 4th of 2017 at 7.07 p.m. Um, my doctor called me up on a Friday night and anytime you get a call from a doctor on a Friday night you, you know it's probably mm -hmm. not a good call and uh, I knew it was on the other end and he told me that I had stage three colon cancer from that day, Julie. Um, you know, I'm, my life has changed in a lot of ways. Uh, I was very scared. The first thing I thought of well, was, you know, how long do I have to live? Because um, when I thought of cancer, and there was no cancer in our family and, and on either side, my wife's or our family, there's no cancer anywhere. But when I heard that news, I'm like, okay, well, how long do I have to live? You know, you feel like a burden, Julie. You feel like you've let everybody down when you have to so-called spread the news. And again, I mean, you know, so-called being in the public eye, you know, I, I wanted to go under a rock and not tell anybody about what ended up taking place. But I think for me is when I went public and told everybody that I was sick and I was diagnosed with stage three colon cancer is that I was going to fight it. I was going to fight it for my family. I was going to fight it for people that don't know me. And I, and I was just going to try to inspire whoever I could by, you know, by knowing my story and becoming so public with it. And during my battle, um, I would take chemo 
every other week for six months and I would take it for 48 hours. So I would go to the hospital on a Monday morning, would take four hours of chemo and then they would send me home with a fanny pack and I had a, a port in my chest where the medicine, the chemo for 48 hours would go every 90 seconds. And when you're going through chemo or you're taking the chemo and you're going through cancer, you have enough quiet time to last you a lifetime. So I would hear that sound and I knew what it was there for, but it was just, it was messing with me physically. It was messing with me mentally. The side effects brought me to my knees. It broke me down mm -hmm. during my second treatment um, on September 15th of uh, 2017 uh i had no control of my body i vomited i had nosebleeds i developed a blood clot i had neuropathy in my fingers and my toes i had bad headaches and i and I'll, i i just i told my wife i'm done i quit because mm -hmm. i wanted the cliff notes version of the chemo julie i i, I just was like how am i going to get through today let alone get through the next five months how am i going to get through the next 10 treatments when i can't even get through this one and i told my wife i quit i'm done and I got the greatest inspirational speech from my wife when she looked at me when I was at my lowest. And my wife, Diana, said to me, look, you got to fight. You got to fight for me. You got to fight for our kids. And you got to fight for all the people that love you. And we had a moment that lasted 30 minutes. I cried for 35 of it. And I was like, OK, I had never quit at anything in my life. And I was ready to quit because the medicine and where I was and how scared I was. But my wife talked me off the ledge and I said, okay, I'm just gonna go day to day. I'm just gonna put my hockey helmet back on and I'm just gonna get through the rest of the day. And when I get up tomorrow, I'm gonna get up and do the same thing again. And when I talk to people now that are in the battle, Julie, I just try to be as honest and transparent transparent with them and just say, look, at you're, you're gonna have some rough days and it's gonna test your will to live but you gotta fight and you can fight through it regardless of what the doctors or what the medicine is doing to you. And, and all I wanna do is try to be inspiration for, you know, for one person. And if I can help them get through the day mm -hmm. where they say, hey, that old broken down hockey player can do it, well then, mm -hmm. you know what, then, then, then I can do it too. And, and the one last thing I will say about that, Julie, is that two things I should say, not one, but two, is that um, what I proved to myself is that I am or I was way tougher than I ever thought I was going through this battle of, of cancer. Anybody that, that takes this battle on uh, head on, this cancer battle is tough. Um, and then the second thing was, is that even though I was very scared, Julie going through my cancer battle and worried and, and, and worried for my family and, and, and scared, is I was very much at peace when I was going through it. And what I mean by that is I've always, I, I don't know where I learned this, but, but I've always let the most important people in my life know how I felt about them. I've always went out of my way and said, look, you know, I, my life is way better with you in it, regardless if it's my wife, obviously, of 33 years or my kids or my folks or my brothers or really, you know, we all have a circle, but those people always have known. And I've always said to him, look, I, you know, God forbid, if something would happen to me and you did not know how I felt about you, you know, it, it would kill me if I wasn't here that you didn't know that I told you how much I loved you and that my life has been fulfilled and complete because you've been in it. So when I was going through that, even though I was scared and I wanted to quit at times and I was worried and I was you know, down and it was breaking me, I was pretty much at peace when I was going through that. And there was something to that. And I said, look, it, 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 if, if it's not meant to be and, and, and I can't pull out of this, then the most important people in my life knew how I felt about them. And that helped me get through. And uh, like I said, I, I hope that when people hear my story um, and, and written the book about it, as you mentioned, is that if people can live and love a little bit more after knowing my story, then it was well worth me telling my story and, and you allowing me to be on your show here uh, today. Oh, well, I mean, Eddie, it's an honor to have you on and for you to be able to share that powerful open message I know has deeply touched so many people. And as a, a person who has a family member who's dealing with cancer, I told them your story, sent them the video that you did with Catherine Tappan, and it really is uh, empowering in hearing 
you know, all the all the bad things that you had to go through to the point that where you are right now, of course, and your perspective on life, because many people don't understand what it's like to experience chemotherapy and also to take care of someone who's experiencing that. And I think that it's so important what you did. And not many people want to be able to come forward and, and talk about that. But you definitely stepped up to the challenge. And I thank you personally as someone who is dealing with someone who has cancer. So thank, thank you, uh, you, you know, I just if I can really really quick. I want to make mention, and, and, and I'm glad that you said that. And something my wife and I really tried to take a, a, a great interest in is that we, we need to not only obviously take care of the people that are ill or are sick and are battling, but also the caretakers and caregivers, because they may not be going through the physical aspect of it, but they are going through it mentally. I never saw my wife down. I never saw her worried around me. Now, I know I've been called an idiot before, and, and, and I'm not an idiot, but I, I know that when my wife was not around me taking care of me, I know she would let her guard down and, and be by herself and, and get emotional and wonder, mm -hmm. like, what's going to happen with him? So I think it's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned it, is that we have to make sure we're reaching out to the caretakers and caregivers of people that it doesn't, it's not only cancer, it could be anything. I mean, even now, I mean, the world we're living mm -hmm. in, I mean, the, you know, the worldwide pandemic is just checking in on somebody and giving giving them a call or a text or an email or whatever we're doing now and just say, Hey, I'm thinking about you. How you doing? You okay? Do you need anything? And, and, and that to me is such an important part of this. And I'm hoping again, if we can just help, if, if I can help or one person with you allowing me on your show, if I can just help one person, if I can inspire them to get through the day, or if I can help them maybe look at things, something a little bit different, then uh, it was it, it was worth us getting together here today to talk about you know my battle with cancer and look I, I'm I'm super excited to be on the right side of the grass and to be able to be a lucky one I mean look I feel feel very lucky and blessed that I had great medical support I had great family support friends people that I didn't even know contacted me and moved right. me well and that helped me out to help me get through my different my most difficult time in my life and I and I did say this after is that you know we we beat cancer I, it wasn't just mm -hmm. any old chick it was we because there were a lot of people that helped me along the way and I'll be forever grateful for that Right. It does take a, a huge support system and to have advocates that can help you along the journey. And as you mentioned, you know, what's the point of this platform if we can't help people with it? So thank you very much again for your very powerful and inspiring story. And we'll have more with Eddie Olchuk on the other side of this break. You're watching Drinks with Brinks. Well, guys, we've had an awesome time drinking and binking here with Eddie Olchek. We've talked about many different topics and we're excited about the NHL season. But Eddie, before then, uh, what do you got going on? What can we look for you to be doing? Well, pretty quiet right now. Just looking forward to Christmas and uh, having uh, our uh, our first Christmas with our granddaughter, which is going to be very, very exciting. But uh, just doing a couple of uh uh, virtual book tours and uh which is pretty exciting as you can see my book over my left shoulder but other than that just kind of preparing for the nhl season and uh, maybe get a horse racing event in maybe before the start of the season i'm not sure but uh always got uh, horses going on pucks and ponies nothing better than that julie so uh really quiet right now but uh, hopefully heating up once we get to the middle of january and hopefully get the nhl back I love it. And those ponies were still riding throughout this entire pandemic, which felt odd, but it was great to be able to place a wager here or there if you so choose. Uh, thank you so much, Eddie, for being here on the show here today. And guys, thank you so much for watching. You know, you can check us out, all of our different episodes in podcast format on Spotify, Apple, as well as YouTube on Twitter and Instagram at Fubo Sports. And we will see you next time. Bottoms up. <laughs>